It's not every day that something comes along and destroys the status quo, or even defines an entire decade. But while the big dogs in Italy were asleep, over in Japan, Honda was changing history. The first year of the Honda NSX absolutely struck the world of supercars. And for a small moment in time, everyone who had anything to do with high performance cars stopped and stayed. As Honda had done the unimaginable, they took everything that had made a Ferrari or a Lamborghini special, the design, the sound, the feel of driving, and for the first time made a piece of art you would actually want to drive. It was the first supercar that being a car wasn't an afterthought. It flipped car design on its head for the next decade and its competitors scrambled to keep up. And yet over at Honda headquarters, even that wasn't enough because the very next year, they built what I consider to be the single greatest car ever made. There's a hierarchy to these things. Royalty, if you will. And the greatest cars to ever come out of that little island, the Toyota 2000 GT, maybe the Skyline GTR Z Tune are legendary. But atop them all, the NSX R, an exercise in insanity. Honda knew that there were always compromises in a road car. The people who buy their cars want air conditioning and comfortable rides. There's only a few lunatics that want to buy race cars from the factory, and so, in most stories, that's the end of that. But not today. Because Honda in the 90s employed some lunatics. Thank God they did. These engineers said to hell with the stereo and the AC, the spare tire, the sound ending, and even the undercoating. Anything that added what they deemed unnecessary weight, like the traction control, they put in smaller batteries, thinner glass, and on and on. They had gone mad in their pursuit of losing weight. The seats became bright red carbon Kevlar ones from Recaro. Before that was the cool thing to do. It got a Momo steering wheel, a lighter titanium shifter, which is rumored to be based on the McLaren F1 as a nod back to which was loosely based on the NSX. They went so far to lose weight that Honda made special wiring harnesses for the car that didn't have the wires for the AC and stereo so they could save just a few grams. It was every engineer's dream to obsess over every detail and Honda let them. It all resulted in losing about 260 pounds, but surely they didn't stop there. Without having to worry about how people felt driving on the street, Honda added more bracing to reduce understeer and add more rigidity. They modified the double wishbones to support a stiffer suspension system designed to increase rear grip. Much bigger sway bar in the front and loads of other tweaks like harder bushings and engine mounts, simply too many to name, many of which made little difference on their own but combined to create a beast. And this was a race car at the end of the day, so the motor got some love too. According to the press release, it made 275 horsepower, just like the original NSX. But that was all a lie to appease a gentleman's agreement Japanese automakers had at the time to avoid a horsepower war like the Americans. The real number was closer to 290 horsepower, but even that's deceiving. The hand-built motor got a balanced and blueprinted crankshaft just like Honda's race cars. This helps the engine be more stable for long periods at high RPMs. The heads were also ported and the exhaust was changed, but on the inside of the muffler, as to not create any suspicion it was souped up. It was also tuned differently to take advantage of Japan's higher octane fuel by advancing the timing of the motor. And what did all these improvements result in? Perfection. The NSXR was famous for being simply the best driving car ever. It was faster than pretty much everything on the track, including cars with much more horsepower and rightfully earns its place atop the hierarchy of JDM cars. However, sadly, none of the 483 NSXRs were sold outside of Japan. And if you want to buy one now, prices are insane if you can even find one. So many NSX owners, especially here in the States, tried to make their cars more like the R. 
and Honda was happy to help them. By selling almost every part you'd want to make your car a little bit better for racing, albeit at a pretty penny. I even bought the NSXR front brace for my car from Honda and picked up a replica of the later NSXR's carbon wing to go on mine that I will be installing in a later video so don't forget to subscribe. Alright, fast forward 5 years to 1997, an exciting year, the Thrust SSC just set the world land speed record of 763 miles per hour, which is still unbroken to this day. Steve Jobs returned to Apple and Honda refreshed the NSX. The first gen NSX can be broken down into two groups, the NA1 and the NA2 which despite common misconception does not refer to the addition of fixed headlights. That happened in 2002. Rather, it refers to the new powertrain. Honda bored out the motor to 3.2 liters and revised the headers and made all sorts of little improvements as they always do. It also got a new six speed manual. And by now all NSXs were target tops and had got power steering. The NA1 is known to be a bit more raw. Not having the power steering means it connects you directly to the road and most being coupes that were more rigid and lighter. The NA2 is a bit more refined. It has a cool target top, although that does add roughly 100 pounds due to the bracing required to support it. The bigger motor and better geared for the street six speed make it a bit faster, but both driving experiences are amazing. And interestingly enough, only the manual got these things. The auto did not get the new motor, but rather a slightly changed automatic transmission because of that was always an NA1. Yes, even when it got fixed headlights. That same year, Honda came out with yet another special edition of the NSX, the Type S. The Type S was made to bridge the gap between the now more GT feeling NA2 NSX and the race car-esque NSXR. It wouldn't be quite as hardcore, but still sportier than the regular model while not beating you up on your commute to the office. To achieve this, Honda did their favorite thing to do and put the NSX on another diet. They got rid of most of the sound deadening, swapped the power steering to a manual rack, Got some cool and lighter BBS wheels, some sweet Recaro buckets, a titanium shift knob, which altogether shaved off almost 100 pounds. Honda then gave it thicker rear sway bars and a new suspension to make it stiffer. The perfect weekend racer it was, but if that wasn't enough for you, they also released the Type S Zero. The Type S Zero was about as extreme as the NSXR. Honda wanted to make a circuit racer and they did. In fact, around Honda Suzuka F1 circuit, it was a second and a half faster than the R. Both the Type S and Type S Zero were coupes compared to the regular Targas at the time, which meant they were more rigid and lighter, which was a good starting place. The Zero got all the stuff from the Type S, but to do this, they once again tossed the AC audio system, reduced the sound ending even further, got no airbags, no traction control. You see a trend yet? They also took the NSXR suspension and tuned it specifically for circuit racing. Unfortunately, once again, these models were Japan only and are very rare and valuable. The Type S only had a 209 units made and Zero was even more rare with just 30 examples made. Making it one of the most rare NSXs out there, one of the most rare JDM cars you can buy. Finally, here in the States in 1999, just in time for the new millennium, we would get our very own special edition NSX. The Zanardi edition, named after racing legend Alex Zanardi, who was a professional race car driver for Honda at the time, to commemorate his back-to-back -back champion kart wins, got his very own special edition NSX. They only made 51 of these, with chassis number 0 being a press car, and number 1 being given to Alex Zanardi himself. These are extremely rare cars, and I was actually fortunate enough to get to see one about a year ago in Sacramento. The first thing that stood out to me was the color on it. It's much different from the all too common red NSXs that I've seen many times. And I learned later that it was the same red as his race car, which is a pretty cool touch. The car itself is very similar to a Type S. It has some unique and cool BBS wheels, bigger brakes, stiffer suspension, and it was also a coupe just like the Type S. So it's favored highly for having the bigger NA2 motor, but the chassis from the NA1 that was lighter. In fact, compared to the regular NSX, it was over 150 pounds lighter, which is truly the best of both worlds. It also went back to the manual steering rack, which I've said many times and I'll say it again, is truly one of the best things of the NSX. And this being more of a commemorative car meant it got lots of little cosmetic touches like stitching and perforated Alcantara, plaques and other little things. 
In 2002, the NSX underwent its facelift and lost the pop-ups for some more modern fixed HIDs and got a new front bumper along with some minor suspension tuning. However, once again in this story, the JDM market got something even cooler, the refresh for the NSX-R. Honda took everything that made the original R great, the weight reduction, further improved suspension, and then added the NA2's bigger 3.2 liter motor and six speed gearbox. The motor was still blueprinted and balanced, and they added some trick aero and lots of carbon fiber. The first thing you might notice on the new NSXR is that hood scoop, which is odd considering the engine is not in the front, but it does serve one hell of a purpose. Made entirely of carbon fiber, it's all part of that trick aero I mentioned. See, the air comes through the front, then goes over the radiator, and Honda sealed off the underside of the car and added a reverse scoop to let that air out. It then goes over the car and hits the new raised wing and generates tons of downforce. They do the same thing in the back under the motor and all helps suck the car to the ground, increasing high speed stability and furthering its already incredible cornering. This results in a car that still being down over 100 horsepower to the competition was on par with the very best from Ferrari and Porsche 10 years later, posting extremely close times to the 911 GT3 and Ferrari 360 Challenge Stradale while still being faster than the V12-powered Lamborghini Diablo VT around the Nürburgring. Just like Honda, I saved the best for last, or at least the craziest and most rare NSX by far. Only five were ever made, most of what is known about them is pure speculation. However, I did the best I could to compile some reliable information on it. It's the ultra-rare 2005 NSXR GT which was a homologation special for Honda to enter Super GT racing. In order to be competitive in the race, Honda planned on twin turbocharging the NSX and almost doubling its horsepower. But to support that and keep the power on the ground, they would need wider wheels and aggressive aero. Rules required that the race car had to closely be based on a production car with at least five examples. The regular NSX didn't have the wider fenders or the scoop, so Honda made five NSX RGTs and sold them for around half a million US dollars. They added a massive front air dam, wider fenders all around, and that love it or hate it giant scoop above the engine bay that rumor is may not actually be functional. Only the few lucky owners of these cars would ever know. However, on the actual race car, it most certainly is functional. And as the name suggests, it's based on the NSXR. So all the go fast parts from that car made it onto the GT. However, the exact suspension tuning and most of the modifications of the chassis are a closely guarded secret. There is, however, one very famous one. The Spoon Motorsport NSXR GT. When this car first came out, rumors were everywhere and it became an overnight legend. And much like an old legend, however, sometimes the story gets a bit skewed. More on that later. What it was was one of Japan's top tuning companies had went crazy. Carbon fiber everywhere, a bespoke twin turbo system putting out 500 plus horsepower. Spoon suspension of massive brakes to try to contain it. Pretty much everything the Japanese tuner made, they threw at this car. All so that the president of the company could take it racing. Now that's the stuff dreams are made of. And looking at pictures, you could tell that this car was driven like it was meant to, and even crashed. But they fixed it, and it raced some more. And it will always be known as JDM's most legendary cars, even if it's not a real NSXR GT. Yes, that's right. Rumors came out so fast on this car, and because it had all the styling of the GT, major news publications weren't the wiser. Spoon had such a good connection with Honda at the time, they were able to get the body panels to fit on their NSX, and at the end of the day, the NSXR GT wasn't any better than an NSXR in the first place. It was simply a homologation vehicle, so Honda could go racing with bigger tires and a scoop. So even if the Spoon Motorsports NSXR GT isn't one of the five, it has more than earned its place as a JDM legend. And if you liked that video and like to see more, please subscribe. You can also see me put some NSXR style parts on my very own NSX, and if you like German cars, I'm also restoring a Porsche 356 at the moment. So stay tuned, thanks for watching.